We're here today, guys, to talk about uh, the E-Flight F-18 Hornet 80mm EDF. Uh, this is actually something we announced a little while ago now. Yep. And it has been uh, actually shipping for a few days now as a time of, of us shooting this video. So some guys have already gotten their hands on it. Uh, some guys have already flown it. A lot of guys like the way it flies, love the way it looks in the air, love the way it looks on the ground. Um, and it is an interesting airplane because a lot of people have always had favorites in, in, in the jet world, F-16s, F-15s. Right. Um, F-18, personally, I've always liked the F-18, but I don't think it's as popular outside of some of those other subject matters. But a lot of people, now that they've seen this in person, they absolutely want to have one. Right. It looks amazing. It's probably the most scale airplane we've ever had. Uh, as far as the level of scale detail, uh, the accuracy of the outline, the accuracy of the landing gear, which we'll get to here in a little bit, uh, there's a lot of really great points to this model, and we call it an extra scale model for that reason. Right. So we've been using that terminology on a few of our airplanes here or there. So uh, the first place we used it was on the F-4. So we have the 80 millimeter uh, F-4 Phantom. Uh, that airplane came out some months ago now. Uh, people absolutely love that. That one was the first of our series of uh, 80 millimeter EDFs. And again, the first time we used that term extra scale. And the reason for that is it's got a level of detail that's not common in uh, a lot of other E-Flight aircraft in particular, or even in other competitive products out in the market. Right. Uh, it's got extra panel lines, a lot of extra surface detailing, and then on top of that, uh, more detailed other features, landing gear, you've got uh, functional gear doors, for example, uh, LED navigation lights, full flying stabs, all those things that I think we've taken for granted over the years. You might have one of those or here, two of those here on a model or so on and so forth. Uh, and then sometimes in smaller scales, you can't have all those details. Right. So for example, our 70 millimeter F-16, even though the full scale has full flying stabs, that model is really too small to have full flying stabs on uh, in order to have the structure to support that and so on and so forth. So when you get to the 80 millimeter class that this is, it's nice because you have more real estate to work with. You can handle a little bit more weight to have a little bit more extra scale detail. And uh, that's again why we, we call this model extra scale in particular. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, guys, this is a very beautiful airplane. I don't know if I mean, yeah. looking at it, it's, it's very clean. We like as Jason mentioned, we we wanted to go really scale with it. Uh, one of my favorite features is probably landing gear. Um, oh yeah. This is a very like Jason said, a very scale landing gear on this airplane. And a lot of our guys that have seen this jet or actually own this jet already have mentioned that the, that the landing gear is one of the, the premium features on this particular jet. Yes, so. by far it's, uh, it, as far as F-18 EDF models go, there are some large scale uh, duct or turbine powered models like right. uh, Bob Violet has a larger scale um, plug and play turbine powered uh, F-18 and that does have very, very scale landing gear. Right. There's been other F-18 EDFs over the years in different sizes and a lot of those have uh, somewhat you know, simplified landing gear. They don't function like the full scale. They don't look quite like the full scale. We tried to get as much of that uh, into our model as possible so we could you know, very confidently say it's got the most scale landing gear of any F-18 EDF that's out there. So right. we'll show you guys the gear here in more detail shortly, but you guys can see just the actuation there alone, how when you unload the main strut, it falls down in this case downward like right. the full scale and then when you land or you know when it's on the ground it compresses much like the full scale so right. it looks awesome we have we have it painted white and i love that the way that the white painted just it just looks realistic um it's just an extra level of detail again extra scale detail that we don't have in a lot of our other aircraft so right. it uh, breaks it a really good good Right. execution of it. It definitely looks like it's ready to land on aircraft gear. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's yes, very it does. Nice. Very nice. We don't have a tow hook. Yeah. We probably should have put a functional yeah. tow hook, hook on cool. just for fun. Uh, I've seen a couple guys mention that they're going to add a tow hook for looks right. um, because that is, is scale of course. Uh, but yeah, this is, is a great subject matter. I think F-18 is a neat aircraft. Yep. Uh, not a lot of people probably realize you know, how long the F-18 has been in service or you know exactly which branches of, of the militaries use the F-18. Um, this particular one, what we wanted to do is a lot of F-18s are gray. That's sure. not uncommon. We tried to find a trim scheme that had some color on it. Uh, it does have, you know, a mostly gray base scheme, uh, but this particular squadron that we modeled this after, the BATS, they have these uh, relatively colorful vertical fins, and that does help with orientation. You can tell top from bottom a lot easier, um, and it, an all-gray airplane is very difficult to see. And this, right. of course, is still mostly gray, so it can be somewhat difficult to see at later times in the day or if you're flying in cloudy conditions. The vertical fins being red and on top, it does help. You can uh, get a better feel for the orientation. And then something else that I think you guys can hopefully see in the video is we've got the LED navigation lights, right. um, at least left on the on the left red wingtip light, and we've got the green right. And that does also help, uh, especially when I've flown this at dusk in, in particular. 
Uh, you can see the fins, but you can definitely see those lights. It does help a lot. It looks awesome. It's an amazing looking airplane. It flies a lot like F-18s. I've flown different scales of F-18s. Right. And a lot of the jets handle differently. So an F-16 does not fly like an F-4, does not fly like an F-18 because of their plan form differences, because of the, you know, maybe the level of drag or the efficiency of the inlets and, and, and the ducting, um, all of them fly a little bit different. So one thing I will point out is although this is an 80 millimeter sized aircraft, so same size as say our, our F-4 and our Havoc, um, this one isn't quite as fast as those. It's still a very fast airplane, but overall this plan form, the, the F-18 shape is a little draggier. Uh, and then on top of that, in the full scale world, this is a twin aircraft, it's got two engines. And in the model world, it's not atypical to uh, simplify that, to have a lower cost, simpler power system. We've got one fan in the middle. So we've got two inlets going to one fan and going out to two exhausts. And so that's not as efficient as uh, say the Havoc, which is almost a straight through shot, right. or even the F4, which is a little bit cleaner shot. That is also a twin, um, but those engines were closer together in the full scale. Yep. So the ducting worked out a little bit cleaner in that model. So um, the I'd say the Havoc is the fastest of the bunch. The F4 is not far behind it. Uh, and then the F18 is a little behind that. It's not slow. I would not call it slow by any stretch. It's over hundred miles per hour in level flight. So that's no problem. Uh, and that is a good performance, got a good vertical performance. But what is amazing about it is the sound. Because it does have that unique duct layout, it does sound different than the F4 and the Havoc. It's right. got this whooshier sound, almost more realistic turbine-like sound to it. And that's the one thing most people pick up on. I've flown it a number of times over the last couple of weeks at different fields. Uh, I, was, I was out in Las Vegas for an event and visiting some family out there. And I went to a couple of different fields and I could hear everybody behind me go, wow, that sounds amazing. It just sounds really realistic really almost. Uh, and so one of the things I'll point out is although it is 80 millimeter, the same size fan that's in the F4 and the Havoc, it also has the exact same motor and the same ESC. Right. So the power system is essentially the same. One difference though is that the F18s all come with the version two fan installed. And some people may not realize the V1 fan and the V2 fan are exactly the same fan design. Basically, the shape is the same. Um, the overall performance is identical. So you put a V2 fan and a V1 fan in the same plane with the same motor, same ESC, same battery, the performance is basically identical. The big difference in the V2 fan is the material it's made out of. So it's made out of a material that doesn't allow the housing in particular to deform as much. Uh, the fan, the, the, the impeller in itself, typically is better balanced. And then on top of that, to secure the fan to the motor shaft, it does have an aluminum hub. And so that aluminum hub does not deform when you tighten it down. And so that helps make the whole fan unit run a bit more concentric and a bit smoother. So uh, something else that we've done is we've been working with this factory uh, for a while now, and um, they weren't balancing the fans as well as we would have liked, and, and especially the Havoc in particular. We've since addressed that. So now Havocs that are shipping have better balanced fans. The fans aren't rubbing as much as they were. Uh, and the V2 fan helps to minimize some of those issues, but then on top of that, we've got them taking extra steps to make sure they're more balanced. So right. people have noticed, not only is the sound cool because the, the way the, the inlet and, and outlet ducting works, but also because the fans are better balanced out of the box, right. which is what we're going for. And you know, it's, it's not likely possible in mass production to have perfectly balanced fans in every airplane, right. but we want them to get as close as possible. And so a lot of people have already remarked that have owned these, that they do actually have, um, it is better balanced. So I uh, had to move the stick there because the transmitter's turned on and, and we're not doing anything with it at the moment, but we wanted to have it all powered up so you guys could see the lights. And then we're gonna show you the landing gear here in action here yep. shortly. Uh, but again, same exact power system as the Havoc, as the F4 80 millimeter airplanes, just the difference of the V2 fan, which again is a material difference. It doesn't really have any difference in performance. So, uh, you know, if you put a V2 fan in, in a, an airplane that had a V1 fan, it's gonna fly basically the same. The big difference is the shrouds don't deform, so you don't get the rubbing of the fan. And then that makes sure that your fan is better balanced right. because you don't get it deformed by rubbing potentially. That did happen in some Havoc airplanes in particular. Uh, some F4s had that issue as well. Again, future batches of those uh, are being addressed as well. So um, those fans are gonna be better balanced and, and better performing out of the box. And then the F18s have the V2 fan to help improve upon that even more so. Right. So that all comes factory installed. Yeah. You don't have to put that in. It's all ready to go. That's my favorite part. And I will say that you know, you've put a couple of these together now, right? I have, yes. Yeah, like, so, like number four. <laughs> how, how hard is it to assemble? Honestly, guys, you could have this jet together in probably 15, 20 minutes. It's Pretty really impressive. not bad. There's, there's nothing to glue. Um, it's all screws. Um, very simple, very straightforward. The novice could do it. While we may not recommend this as a, somebody's yeah. first aircraft, first no, jet. No, definitely not. Yeah. Um, it's very simple to put together. So for the guys that actually want to get as much, you know, to minimize as much downtime at the field and more, more flight time, this yes. is a really 
good jet to get into. You know, very simple to put together. Yeah, even though it's one of our uh, most scale detailed aircraft, one of our largest E-Flight uh, bind and fly plug and play aircraft, and, and to some degree, some, one of the most complex. You've got you know, two vertical fins, you've got full flying stabs, you've got retractable landing gear flaps. It goes together with a number, like a dozen bolts. Yeah. That's it, there's no glue required. You don't have to do any painting. Uh, there's only one decal that you have the option of applying. There's an American flag decal that goes on the back here if you so choose. Uh, you don't have to install it, some people don't, uh, but that's it. It can have it assembled in about 15 minutes. It will probably take you longer to uh, charge the battery and to program the radio than it will take to actually assemble the aircraft, which is amazing. That's my kind of airplane. I've been in the hobby a long time and, and I've built all kinds, everything from scratch built to composite kits, wood kits, and I didn't mind assembling so much, but at the same time, my <laughs> these days, my <laughs> preference is to have something that bolts together. Uh, in this case, it takes just a two millimeter driver and I think a, and a, and a Phillips screwdriver, and yep. that's it, and you're ready to go. And so it comes out of the box and it looks phenomenal all put together. Uh, one thing that's really cool is we do include the ordnance that you guys are seeing here. Yep. We've got the, 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 the tip mounted missiles, wing mounted missiles, we've got drop tanks, there's a center tank under there as well. And all of these slide on and off, so they're optional use. So again, these are included. A lot of other aircraft you have to buy these for separately as a you know, 30 or $40 option part. They're already included in the box of the airplane. They're painted to match. And then they just go into slots here, which is super convenient. Uh, personally, I like to fly with the tip missiles installed. I think it looks awesome with those, but then I do leave a lot of the, the, the drop tanks. I usually leave all the drop tanks off and then the wing mounted missiles because those do, as, as cool as they look, they do add drag. So that slows it down a little bit more. Now it can fly with all of that installed, but the top speed's a little bit lower. The vertical performance is a little bit down. Your flight time is probably a little bit shorter because you're carrying right. more throttle. And I've flown it both ways. Uh, and again, it looks awesome with everything hanging down but I kind of appreciate the extra performance that you get by just having maybe the tip missiles installed. Sometimes I'll fly with the centerline tank on rare occasion, right. but that is even noticeable in and of itself, um, the, uh, the extra kind of drag from that. Right. So, but it is a nice touch that those are included and just sitting on the bench with all the, well, when I have it just sitting around, I'll usually stick all the stuff on it because it just looks cool. Right, <laughs> right. But assembly is super easy and that is uh, something we've always strived for with a lot of e-flight aircraft. We want to make the airplanes as easy to put together as possible because the goal here is to get you out and flying. Right. Not to glue stuff together, paint stuff especially, uh, anytime we can avoid that. And uh, we want to make it more accessible for more people. But like you said, this is not for a beginner. Right. Yeah, so I think some guys might be sitting there thinking, ooh, that looks really cool. This will be my first radio controlled airplane. No, absolutely not. This is not a first radio controlled aircraft by any stretch. This is definitely intended for a skilled pilot. Right. You have to have quite a bit of experience flying airplanes in general and also EDF jets. This would not be a good first EDF jet. So even if you've flown many different airplanes, if you've never flown a ducted fan or a jet before, I wouldn't recommend starting out with this. This right. would be a good maybe second jet for a skilled pilot, pretty skilled pilot, uh, but probably more like a third or fourth jet. I think a person has to have some experience with not only a relatively easy handling jet like the, let's say, 70 millimeter Viper. Right. Viper 70 millimeter, phenomenal first full house jet. It's got flaps, it's got retracts. That's a great choice. Uh, prior to that, also, there's a slightly smaller F-15 which is uh, less complicated. It doesn't have flaps, doesn't have retracts, the F-15, 64 millimeter. Those are both great first jets. But I would fly this after I've flown something like at least the Viper, then maybe the F-16, 70 millimeter. Um, those the airplanes too. and F -16. the F-15 as well is, is, is in there. Uh, but I would say you gotta have that kind of a little bit of difference in handling. The Viper is a really smooth, easy handling airplane. It almost flies just like a low wing sport airplane, but it's powered by a ducted fan. And then the F-16 is a little draggier and it does have a little bit uh, more similar handling to the F-18 than the Viper does. Right. And so once you've flown those, I think you could successfully fly this. And we do actually have it available in the Bind and Fly Basic version with AS3X and Safe Select. Right. We also sell a plug and play version. You know, some guys out there already have their own receiver or want to use a higher channel count receiver so they can separate different functions. Um, but the Bind and Fly Basic version does have pre-programmed AS3X. AS3X doesn't do anything other than smooth things out for you. So when you're flying in turbulent conditions and windy conditions, instead of the airplane bouncing around, it smooths it out for you. It makes it feel more locked in. And I gotta say, this thing feels really locked in yes. all the time. It is just on rails, partly because of the, the airframe, the aerodynamics of the airframe, but also in part because of AS3X in particular. So uh, that helps smooth things out in the wind. Then you have the option to use safe select. And I know we were just talking about, this is not a beginner airplane. This is not a first jet. So why would a person want safe select? Well, you know, safe select is optional use. You don't have to bind with it active. You can put it on a switch so you can turn it on and off. 
Um, and the beauty of having Safe Select is that you know, there are tangible times, even as an experienced pilot, I might benefit from having it. So for example, I can hand it off to a less experienced pilot with my help without having to do a buddy box, I can flip it in a safe, so at least they can get a kind of feel for the airplane a little bit in the air. Uh, let's say I accidentally fly through the sun, lose orientation. Blinded. Yeah, <laughs> I can flip on safe select and I can get make sure the airplane is, is level. Uh, and then on occasion, you know, I, you might cheat a little bit. Like let's say it's a really bad crosswind. Uh, safe select does have self-leveling, so when you let go of the stick, it goes back to level. It does also have pitch and bank angle limits, so you can't get too far nose up, too far nose down, you can't roll upside down. And again, you let go of the stick and it locks in. So if you're landing in a crosswind, you can cheat a little bit, just turn on safe selecting. You don't have to worry about fighting the wing down. You'll still have to fly the plane down to the ground and, and use some rudder to you know, keep it on heading and so on and so forth. But there are a lot of benefits to safe select. And, and again, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to. It's, it's optional. optional for a reason. So again, bind and fly basic version is available, plug and play version is available. The Bind and Fly Basic version in the US, uh, the price is $469.99, so about $470 US. The plug and play version is $30 less, so uh, that would be $439.99, so about $440 US. And uh, those prices do vary in different markets, of course. Uh, these are in stock and shipping now in the US. So as you guys are seeing this video live, and then when we post this later on YouTube in the next couple days here, uh, again, at the moment, they're in stock. They are yep. selling fast. It's actually taken off. I think people are really, really liking the way it looks. Now that some people have also kind of put their flight reports out there, people are hearing how great it flies, and I think a lot more people are jumping on it. So if you want one, get it fast. Uh, we might sell out of these here shortly, and that might take a while for us to get more. Uh, and then they will be shipping in Europe. Uh, roughly in a week or two from the time of us um, doing this video as of today. Right. So uh, keep an eye out for them there. If you haven't already, make sure to pre-order or back order one with your favorite dealer uh, in Europe in particular. Uh, if you're in the US, you should be able to get it from your favorite local hobby shop uh, at the moment. They might already have one in stock or they can definitely get one from us. Uh, you can also, of course, order on horizonhobby.com right. as well. So, so yeah, available, available now. Yep, so uh, guys, I do wanna mention that we are taking some questions today. So if you have any specific yes. questions that you have, we will call them out. I see there's quite a, uh, quite a few questions already. But before we get into that, I do wanna show guys, the guys the landing gear. They do wanna yeah, see it. Yeah, so let's, let's see the landing gear in action. Yeah, so first and foremost, he's gonna pick it up. Cody's gonna pick it up there. And you guys can see, again, the extension of the main gear, just like the full scale. And then when I flip the switch for the retracts, you're gonna see the whole action. So the nose gear goes in, it's got a door, main gear go in, even the nose gear final door is then sequenced. And I'll flip the switch back and it happens in the opposite order. And you guys might've noticed that the main gear does rotate as it is uh, retracting into the belly of the airplane. And yeah, the functionality there is again, a lot like the full scale. The landing gear looks fantastic. Uh, does have a shock absorbing nose gear. The main gear are shock absorbing to a degree. Now we had, uh, some people have, have wondered about the main gear in particular. You know, why doesn't it stand up more? Why isn't there more shock absorption? Why aren't the springs stiffer? Well, the reason for that is if the springs were stiffer, it would change the attitude of the airplane. So imagine we've got springs in there that give us like a quarter inch or so of, uh, of some give there. The problem is now the airplane is gonna be very nose down. It's gonna be very much, very difficult pretty much off. impossible to yeah. rotate and take off. Yeah. And so uh, after working with the geometry a bit, trying all kinds of different springs, different weights uh, of springs, we ended up with a setup that has enough spring that even when the airplane is upside down, you can see the landing gear stays extended. There are springs in the main gear. But then when you land or you know, when you're are on the ground, it is essentially to some degree bottomed out. Right. Now that is uh, not a bad thing. Some right. people have been concerned that that's going to mean there's a lot of extra load going into the airframe or onto the landing gear. And that is true to some degree, but the functionality of this gear, again, we wanted to make sure it would rotate for takeoff. Um, and that is an issue we had to consider uh, that it also didn't have too heavy a springs to where it would bounce around a lot. Um, and I've seen this in the, by the BVM in particular, right. larger scale F-18, where the springs were too stiff and it was bouncing back and forth and it was kind of leaning off to one side. If he landed too hard, if he came in too hard, he bounced right. really hard and, and, and it went up and down a lot. So this airplane, what's nice about it is when you come in on approach, it's very easy to land with the nose high, which looks very scale. Um, so a little bit of a high alpha attitude and just to kind of grease it onto the mains. And then that kind of pulls the nose of the airplane down and it doesn't bounce. It doesn't have, now you'll notice if you watch our launch video, we do actually have a very bad landing there in slow-mo that you guys can see the, uh, the action of the gear as that airplane comes in. And I mean, it hit hard and it bounced 
really, it was a very bad landing. Right. Uh, and so if your landings look like that, definitely you want to practice some more. Uh, hopefully that's not a, a typical landing for right. you, but we wanted to show that the gear does have some shock absorption to it. Uh, and then at the same time, if you land it as you should, you're gonna have no issues at all. It does have like heavy duty retracts. So the retract units in this model are much larger than anything else that we've ever had. So they're larger than the units that are in the F4 or even the Havoc. And then it's got very, very large diameter pins. Right. When you look at the pins, you're like, wow, those are pins because they're so large diameter, you wouldn't have expected that. And then the main gear, all of that is aluminum and, and steel. So that's all metal, that, that landing gear there. And so some people are wondering if that was plastic, it's not, and uh, it looks scale um, and we painted it, but again, it's, it's not plastic there. There are a couple of plastic detail features on the nose gear, some of the decorative features there, nothing that uh, affects the, um, the overall performance of the nose strut. Everything right. else on the nose strut is metal as well. And right. of course you can see that shock absorbing. So if you're taxiing over some kind of you know, cracks here or there on the runway, that'll help uh, you know, keep the nose light so it's not digging into the ground. But again, that main gear design, we wanted it to, to look the way it does so it was as scale as possible. We wanted it to function well, but then to also not get in the way of takeoffs and to also not cause bouncing or weird leans or anything like that um, on, on bad landings and right. anyone who's taxiing around in general. So while we're yeah. on the topic of the landing gear, a lot of things that has been coming up, especially on RC groups and online, is will this airplane fly off grass? Oh, yes, yes. So, uh, it, yes and no. It depends on your grass surface. So I would not say this airplane is as grass capable as say the Havoc 80 millimeter or even the F4. Uh, it has smaller wheels. That's one consideration. Also the layout of the landing gear and the layout of the airframe. It does need to get up to speed to be able to rotate. So uh, that is a little bit more difficult on grass. If you have very, very short grass, finely manicured grass, like you know what we fly when we're at uh, Triple Tree Aerodrome, flying for Joan Alp, that grass is no problem, of course. Uh, not everybody has access to grass like that. So there are places that this isn't going to be well suited for that particular grass surface. So we can't say it won't work on all grass. That's not true, it works on some. Uh, but it's probably not as grass capable as some of our other aircraft are. So right. the Viper 70 millimeter will fly off of, of thicker grass than this can, or again, the Havoc 80 millimeter, that can also fly off of grass that is thicker than, than what uh, this airplane can handle. So it is grass capable to some degree. There's a lot of variation, a lot of difference in your grass surfaces. So you'll probably know that. If you have a similar sized model with similar sized wheels, ductive fan, and it's flying off grass, it would probably work fine. Uh, but we don't specifically mention uh, over mentioned, you know, grass ops because uh, it wasn't necessarily designed for that. Not, not every airplane is. Certain airplanes, based on their size and scale, just can't do it. Uh, and again, the main gear on this are relatively scale, including the wheels and tires, so they're not very, very large. And, and that is one consideration when you're flying off of grass. Right, right. So Jordan had mentioned uh, specific to the landing gear. He wanted to know how the landing gear amounts to the airplane. Has it got reinforced plastic? Uh, is it metal? Yeah, so we've got a combination of materials inside the, the gear mounts, uh, but they are beefed up. So uh, again, we kind of consider it heavy duty landing gear. The main gears in, in particular go into to plastic that's glued directly into the airframe. Uh, they are replaceable. We do sell the retract units separately in case you damage one, or uh, if you have a potential failure down the road, uh, the nose gear is very, very solidly mounted as well. And so we have done some takeoffs and landings on grass. Uh, and as long as the grass was short enough and it got off the ground, no problem. Um, and we've had some bad landings here or there and we haven't broken the gear mounts out. Now, it is possible. I've seen guys land extraordinarily hard to where you know they just blow the gear out of an airplane. And we haven't done that on this model yet. That's not to say someone won't, it's possible. But we did specifically have heavy duty gear put into this model. The retract units themselves, the struts themselves, and then even the mounting points themselves are beefed up over what you know some of the other models, especially scale models, uh, have been in the past. Right. Uh, another gentleman wants to know specific to the, to the decals, why mm. is the American flag the only one that we didn't put on? Uh, it, there's a lot of complex curves back here. So getting that decal on aligned straight and then going and covering all those curves. Uh, there's, there's like an air brake back here that basically that goes on top of. That's where they have the full scale um, flag painted on. So we kind of left it for people to put on there on their own to make sure that it met their, their standards. Okay. Yeah. Um, F4 Phantom, gentleman just purchased one of those and wants to know how the fan would be on that one. Is it gonna be just as good as the F18? Yeah, so the, again, the fans, they perform the same. So uh, newer batches of, of F4s and, and Havocs in particular have better balanced fans from maybe what they did in earlier batches. Uh, but the performance of the fans of the V1 and the V2 are identical. 
basically identical. So same motor, same ESC is in the Havoc, the F4, and the F18. So the performance is pretty much the same. The difference there is really going to just be the airframes. The F18 is a little slower than the F4, which is a little slower than the Havoc. But uh, your F4 is going to fly great. You know, I've flown the heck out of my F4, and I have one of the very first ones. Uh, and my fan wasn't that terribly well balanced, and uh, it still performed very, very, very well. So I think you'll be very happy with that performance. Good deal. Yeah. Um, how about batteries? What batteries uh, yeah, are we yeah. using and what kind of fly times are we seeing? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, what I like about 80 millimeter ducted fans in particular is that they kind of hit a sweet spot for batteries. And uh, there are 90 millimeter aircraft out there that you can run on say a 6S5000 and it works, but the performance isn't phenomenal and you get maybe two and a half to three and a half minutes of flight time if you're lucky. Uh, and so what's nice about this model is the battery compartment is relatively large and we can fit everywhere from a 6S4000 all the way up to a 6S7000. Now I'd say the sweet spot for most people is going to be the 5000, which of course is extremely common size of battery. A lot of guys have these 5000s, but um, the one nice thing about the 80 millimeter size is you can get away with a slightly smaller battery like a 4000 or a 4500. I've uh, recently purchased quite a few 4000s because I've been flying those in my 80 millimeter jets and in my 70 millimeter jets. So I like having batteries that have the op option to go into a lot of different models. I do have quite a few 5000s as well because I use these in you know, some larger scale aircraft like our Carbon Z Cub and the Carbon Z Cessna in particular. Uh, I will say I've flown it quite a bit with the 7000. I like the way it flies with the 7000. It is a little heavier, uh, it's a little more nose heavy, but it does have a really locked in feel and you get a little extra flight time. So with the 7000, I've been flying it, um, <laughs> I've done this a few times, I probably shouldn't, but I've been flying for upwards of six minutes pretty hard. Uh, and coming down with you know only maybe 20% left in the battery, 15% left in the battery. With a 5,000, I usually set my timer for uh, closer to four and a half to five minutes. And then with the 4,000, I go down about 20% from that. So uh, I usually don't fly the 4,000s more than three and a half to four minutes just to be safe. I do like to have some juice to go around if needed. Your flight time will vary depending on how you fly, how much full throttle you use, the performance of your batteries, that also impacts it a lot. Uh, and this will be my plug as always for Spectrum Smart Batteries. Absolutely love these batteries because they have the ability to self-discharge to storage voltage. So you can program these batteries anywhere from uh, one hour up to I think 240 hours. And after that time period, they will self-discharge down to storage voltage. And that's nice because let's say Friday night, you charge up all your batteries, you go to the field Saturday, you maybe fly a couple of them. Maybe Sunday you go back to the field, you fly a couple more and you got a couple batteries on Sunday night that you haven't discharged to storage voltage. It used to be you had to rush home, put those on the discharger, wait around for a couple hours for them to discharge the storage voltage before you go to bed uh, to make sure that your batteries last a long time. These do that for you. Right. That's my favorite aspect. Something else that uh, I really like about the smart batteries, if you have our smart battery checker as well, is after your flight, you plug the smart battery into the checker, and when you do that, it will actually show you the temperature of the battery. So that's really nice. Of course, you can, you can hold the battery, kind of tell, you can hit it with an IR temp gun, you can kind of tell that way, but if you plug it in, the internal circuitry in the battery will actually show you uh, the temperature on the screen. So I've flown all these exact batteries here, um, including especially the, the 6S5000-30C battery, and I know some guys are gonna say, hey, 30C, you can't use a 30C battery in a jet. You can. If it's a properly rated 30C battery, that's fine. A 30C 5,000 milliamp battery can handle 150 amps. This airplane does not pull 150 amps at full throttle. If you're averaging about a five minute flight time, that's a 12C average discharge. A 12C average discharge on a 30C battery should be no problem if it's accurately rated. There are a lot of 30C batteries out there that aren't 30C batteries. They right. say they are, but they're probably like maybe a good 15C battery. So in a 12C application like this or a 15C application, they'll probably overheat and die very quickly. So we've been using these Spectrum Smart batteries for a very long time in a lot of applications now. No issues with the 5030C in any of our 80 millimeter jets. Um, the power system that we use is very well optimized. It's got pretty darn good performance. Uh, not an excessive amount of current draw to get the job done and get it done well. And so again, I really like 80 millimeter because you've got that range of 6S4000 to 7000. You might be able to squeeze an 8000 in there if you've got one. It's a little tight. The 7000 kind of fits like a glove, but um, any of these batteries work very, very well for this application. Very good. How does this particular airplane fly compared to the Havoc? Oh, it's a very different animal. You know, the Havoc was uh, or is designed intentionally for aerobatic maneuvers in particular. So the Havoc is capable of really cool snaps and spins and pop tops and aerobatic maneuvers that a scale jet like this isn't capable of. But something that this is capable of, which the Havoc is not, is high alpha flying. 
So like the full scale, uh, it can actually kind of fly with the nose up. Uh, it does take some extra skill to do that, uh, but you can fly it more high alpha like an F-16. So this F-18 flies more like an F-16 than a Havoc. The Havoc is a sport jet and it handles more like a sporty airplane versus the F-18 handles more like a scale fighter aircraft. So uh, it's got a little more drag when you pull through turns, you kind of feel that. It slows it down a little bit. So the top speed, again, not as fast. It is aerobatic, you can do loops, rolls, point rolls, inverted flying, no problem. Uh, and so it just is a, it is a different experience. I would take both to the field because I enjoy having that difference of experience every time I, I, I go flying. Uh, and again, they're, they're very different. So a lot of people are gonna probably end up owning both for that reason. Absolutely. Yeah. When do we expect these to ship in the UK? Uh, so the UK will be based on the EU shipment, so probably in the next few weeks here from the time you guys are seeing this video. So hopefully sometime, possibly the end of October here, 2019, uh, maybe into November, uh, depends on getting the shipment from uh, our EU warehouse to uh, the UK guys over there. So, uh, but very, very, very soon, uh, and that's very exciting. So uh, we announced this just a couple weeks ago, and as we've been trying to do these days, we try to condense that time between when we announce the product and when it's available. I know some guys have said, why do you announce anything before you have it? And the reason for that is because sometimes people need to, you know, kind of plan for it accordingly, save up for a couple of weeks, uh, sell an airplane or two to make room for it in their hangar. Uh, so we try to get it out there again, pretty quickly after we announce it. Uh, but it's usually anywhere from two to three weeks, four weeks, give or take. Now in Europe, it does handle a little bit differently because um, we do have distribution, different distribution outlets over there. Uh, but typically, it's not very far behind the U.S. as it yeah. is in this case. I think it's a perfect, the delay is perfect. I know in my case, I had to buy my wife flowers, you know, two weeks in advance just because <laughs> if I come up with another airplane, I'll be sleeping on the couch. So. Yes, there is that. There, there is, is that. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons and to each their own. Yes. So uh, something we, we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier is one of the extra scale features of this airplane is that it's got full flying stab, just like the full scale aircraft. Uh, and so that's really cool. It does have twin operating rudders. You guys can probably see that there. Of course, steerable nose wheel up in the front. Uh, we got ailerons as usual, we got flaps as usual, um, and we don't have the delay turned on right now on, on this setup here, but uh, it does have the flaps. Of course, you saw the retracts, so it is a six channel aircraft. So you can fly it, you see we got it bound up here to a DX6E, and it will fly just fine. The catch is, if you want to use Safe Select on the Bind and Fly Basic version, you need to have a seventh channel available to actuate Safe separately. Right. Otherwise, you'd have to tie it into your flaps, which you can do. So when your flaps are down, with the right combination of programming, your Safe can be on. When your flaps are up, Safe is off. Right. I don't recommend doing that if you can avoid it, which is why uh, these days an eight channel radio is always preferred. We are gonna have more and more aircraft like this that come out that are seven or more channels, uh, especially when you have Safe Select as an option. And so for that reason, if anybody's in the market for new radio, I strongly recommend these days, making sure you buy an eight or more channel transmitter. There, were, uh, there was a long time there where you could buy a six channel transmitter and you could, you could do everything for most yeah. airplanes. Yeah. Uh, but these days, I think you're gonna need that eight channel transmitter to uh, take advantage of all those features, to again, have Safe Select on a separate channel. Uh, and then for those that haven't programmed Safe Select, the manual course walks you through that. Uh, and you can basically assign it to any channel between five and nine. Channel five is your gear on this model. Channel six are your flaps. So I usually assign it to channel seven, my aux two. And then you can choose the switch that you assign it to. But for the most part, we typically assign it to this uh, kind of front shoulder here. Um, again, not on the six channel, but on the seven channel transmitter uh, or eight channel transmitter. But again, that's a good reason to upgrade your transmitter if you haven't already. Right. Another gentleman on here is wanting to know um, if we can remove the decals on it. Now, this particular airplane, guys, is just like a standard stick-on decal. Yeah. If you use heat, and you, you, can, you can back them off if you, you apply heat, generally. You can make it into a, a base gray if you want to paint yes. it something else. That's always an option. I don't think there's a lot of decals really on this airplane. There aren't a ton. There's not a ton. Yep. It wouldn't be difficult to do, but it, it could be done. So for the guys yes. that are asking if you can make it a different scheme, you can. It's not yeah, right. there's a little bit of modeling involved to make that happen, a little bit of work. Like you said, apply some heat. You can also use, some people use ice sometimes to also cool down the adhesive. Uh, there are ways to get the decals off. We do have the decals applied out of the box because the vast majority of us appreciate that. I know some people believe that more people want to personalize it. It's actually not true. You, you don't see as much personalization um, as, as you might expect. So definitely guys do, without a doubt. I've seen a lot of other EDS repainted, including our own, uh, but the vast majority of us, myself included, I wanted to come out of the box with decals on it because otherwise I get a little carried away trying to get my decals all lined up and make sure there's no wrinkles in them and it takes me hours to put decals on when I should be out flying. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point, absolutely. There is that, there is that. So yeah. a lot of guys have been tuning into the smart stuff that we've yeah. been announcing. So these guys wanna know if this airplane has smart in it or when will we introduce smart ah, in okay. aircraft. So this 
particular model does not have a smart ESC. It does not have the new 637 receiver, which were recently announced. Um, the beauty of that is down the road, there will be some of our aircraft that include that. When you have a smart ESC in the aircraft and you have that 637 receiver with the full range telemetry, as far as you can fly the airplane out, you're gonna get telemetry back to your transmitter. You're gonna get battery voltage, you're gonna get ESC temp, motor RPM, all of that built into any of your airware equipped transmitters with the latest version software, uh, which is a great, great value add. It's a great function to have. You don't have to have a separate current device plugged in, voltage measuring device plugged in, temp probe. You don't have to have all that stuff. It all comes through the uh, signal wire on the ESC. And so again, this model does not have it. Um, in the future, some models will. It does cost a little bit more, so we're not gonna just put it in every model, uh, but down the road, it is going to become more commonplace in a lot of our aircraft. And of course, right now, if you need a separate ESC for an application, I strongly recommend buying the Smart ESC. What's really cool about the Smart ESC as well is if you use it with a smart battery, it will actually give you individual cell voltages. It'll give you the temperature of the battery, uh, a little more data than you get with a regular battery because you have uh, the chip inside the smart battery with that third wire communicating into the ESC. So one thing guys, you can use smart batteries with a regular charger. You can use smart batteries with a regular ESC. You can use a uh, regular battery with a smart ESC and a smart charger. There isn't any, it's not proprietary, it's not specific. The only thing that's proprietary is the smart to smart functionality. So you have to have smart devices working together to get all the smart data, but they also work as standalone individual simple products uh, if needed. So again, you can use the smart battery in any application and you can use the smart ESC in pretty much any application and get some of those extra smart benefits. Right, so the hobbies that have been around for a while, guys, the smart is truly innovative. We're super yeah. excited about it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out with a ducted fan jet and either forget to hit my yeah, timer. Yeah, you, you told me you or, don't use a timer. Yeah, don't use a timer. Ooh. And you're just guessing three minutes, four minutes. I, I usually do pretty good, but yeah. the smart system is going to be really nice because it's going to you can set up a warning to when your voltage is going to be low, come right. and land, not worry about your timer, not worried if you hit the button or not. This stuff's going to be really cool. And if you guys are interested, you know, you can put an Avion ESC into this and have all that you know, in your jets or whatever yes. model you're wanting to put in, yep. it's really going to be a, a good thing for pretty much any model going forward. It is, yeah. I think it's going to be um, the revolutionary in the hobby in general. It already has been to some degree. Just the smart batteries alone, I've, I've been using LiPo batteries for almost 20 years now. Uh, I was one of the first guys to use them in, in electric powered helicopters and even electric ducted fans um, many, many years ago. And uh, one of the things that I always struggled with in the last few years as chemistry's changed, I had gotten used to with old lipos, leaving them fully charged for months or even right. heck, years on end, and it didn't hurt them. With the new modern day chemistries that we use for higher performance, uh, those chemistries are not as stable at full charge, which is why you don't want to leave your batteries fully charged. You know, my dad, He's probably watching this or he will watch this later. Uh, I used to always remind him, you gotta discharge your batteries, Dad, after you go flying. If you didn't use them, you gotta discharge them back to storage voltage. And a couple of the guys in the field said, ah, you don't need to do that, don't worry about that. He just did it one week, he didn't discharge those batteries. The next week he went to fly and his batteries were puffed up. So that happens, guys. Again, smart batteries, you can program them. So they self-discharge anywhere from one hour to 240 hours. We have ours set typically to 48 hours. So we can charge on Friday night, go flying Saturday, go flying Sunday. And if we uh, are you know, not using all of our batteries by Sunday night, they self-discharge the storage for us, which is, oh, love it. Absolutely love Super that feature. Helpful. Super yeah, helpful. Yeah, it'll save you batteries in the long term. Uh, and then, by the way, guys, make sure you check out the prices on the 30C batteries. In particular, we dropped them recently. The sales have really picked up. Uh, guys are absolutely loving not only the smart features, but these are really good cells. Again, guys, I've been using LiPos for a long time. I've been to a lot of LiPo factories uh, in Asia, um, and I can tell you these are some of the best cells that are out there, hands down. Small, compact, lightweight, more accurately rated than a lot of other batteries out there, and the cycle life is, is, is already good. But then on top of that, having the self-discharge capability is going to make the battery last even longer. Yeah. So it's a good investment. It's similar price to a standard battery. So be sure to check those out, guys. Yeah, definitely get quite a few of those. More more reasons for me to sleep on the couch. So. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Just buy more flowers. You'll yeah. be fine. <laughs> flowers yeah. for days. Oh, yeah, my you'll goodness. be fine. So any other questions that have come up? I'm not seeing anything else in here. Um, couple guys want to know the weight. I don't think we actually have the exact weight. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, it is on our product page, you guys. If you go there, there's always a tab for specifications. You can see the flying weight. We usually publish it with the battery, typically. Uh, I think when this first got put on our website, we had the weight without the battery, but we went ahead and adjusted that. So you can see that spec there. Uh, it's very typical for this class of model. Um, I think it's right around six, six and a half pounds. Uh, and it doesn't fly heavy. In fact, let me speak to the way it flies. It is 
a really neat experience. It, it flies like it looks. It flies like a fighter. And so it doesn't feel heavy, but it feels really locked in, partly because of the plan form, partly because of I've been flying the Binding Flight Basic version with AS3X in particular, but it just, it kind of feels like it's on rails and it goes where you point it. It's really rock solid in that regard. It's got really good, solid top speed. Again, not the fastest EDF in this class, but pretty darn good speed, pretty darn good vertical performance. Super easy to loop and roll it. Uh, it rolls quite axial. Um, it does have a pretty darn decent roll rate, um, even with the box stock setup. Uh, the elevator rate is really good. You can basically pull full up and it does a nice loop uh, at level flight, no problem. And then landing it is not particularly difficult. Again, I'm not saying this is a good first airplane period. I'm not saying it's a good first EDF. Part of it is because it does handle a little differently on landing, but it is not hard to land. Uh, there are videos out there now, uh, including our own original launch video. Uh, some other videos have been posted by some other pilots that have bought these and flown them recently. And you'll notice it is really locked in, smooth coming in. It's easy to keep the nose up. Oh, one thing you gotta watch out for though, is if you have your battery too far forward and you've got it too nose heavy. I know a lot of guys will argue, nose heavy is better than tail heavy, sort of. You know, if a plane is too tail heavy, it's unflyable. If a plane is too nose heavy, it doesn't perform well, period. A combination of things happen. One, when you go to take off, it's hard to rotate. What'll happen is you'll be, I'll admit, the very first few times I flew this, I didn't really check the CG that closely. I had my battery up in the nose thinking, oh, where, this is where the Velcro is approximately. Battery should go here. And the first couple times I flew it, I had full up elevator and it jumped off the ground. It didn't really rotate and fly off the ground. And the reason for that is I was nose heavy. Then I moved my battery back closer to our recommended CG range. Uh, now it wasn't as nose heavy and now it rotated better. Uh, one thing though, because of the, um, the, the angle of attack, the attitude of this aircraft on takeoff, it does benefit to use flaps. That does help it rotate a little, little bit more. So I've been using the lower flap setting. Uh, you know, some people say takeoff flaps for takeoffs. Sure. And then on landing, I've, I've done a combination. I've landed it without flaps. I've landed it with the, the partial flaps or the low flap setting or the takeoff flaps. And I've done it with the full flaps. And uh, obviously with full flaps, it's draggier. You have to carry more power. And so when you put the gear down on this model and you put the flaps all the way down on this model, it's, it's already a somewhat draggy airplane. It gets quite draggy with that. So you gotta watch out for um, making sure you keep your speed up, but it's not hard to do. You can find the right throttle setting. It's a little over half power. You can kind of just fly this thing around with uh, the gear down and full flaps down. And it's super easy to line it up on approach, get that nose high and make those beautiful nose high landings. It is again, not difficult, it's different. Uh, and I, that's why I think it's important you have some skills and some experience flying. Uh, not only you know high performance aircraft but also jets in particular and also preferably some experience flying something like the 70 millimeter f-16 or another fighter model that has similar characteristics yeah fly scale land scale fly scale and it looks yeah. looks amazing That's sounds great. fantastic i gotta say i have never in many many years now of going and doing demos at fields heard so much chatter behind me when i was flying both the comments of how it looks and the comments of how it sounds i could just hear guys going man that sounds phenomenal and uh, i was actually out flying it in las vegas not far from nellis air force base where uh, quite a few guys that fly at that field are either uh Air Force pilots or, or work in the Air Force and they see, they've seen F-18s out there training. Now, of course, F-18 is not used by the Air Force, but they go out there and do some, some cross uh, sure. unit training and different things like that. And they've seen the F-18 in action. Like, man, that thing looks like the real deal. Flying by the mountains, ripping by down low. Uh, it is a phenomenal looking airplane, handles really, really well. I honestly was surprised when I flew it. I, I didn't really have an expectation per se, but when that very first flight within two minutes, I was like, wow, this thing is just solid. It's so locked in. And I'll admit, I was actually a little nervous on that first landing. I was like, mm, I don't know, man. It's... So I put the flaps down about halfway. I didn't do the full flaps. I, you know, I wanted to keep the speed up a little bit more. Um, and it, piece of cake. First, first landing looked really, really good. People were like, wow, that was nice. And I was like, yeah, it was my first landing. They're like, wow, that's... It's a testament to how the airplane flies and again, how it lands. And I think that's one of the things over the next couple months, as guys publish more videos and more reviews on it, I think they're all gonna tell you the same thing. It flies really good. It's yeah. a solid flying airplane, feels good, it looks good. Landing is not difficult, just a little different than some of your average airplanes. Um, and yeah, it just, it, it definitely, it provides an experience you do not get with a lot of other airplanes, Right. period. So the scale look of the landing gear, the scale look of the finish, um, the overall presence, it's not a small airplane. It's not a particularly big airplane. You guys can probably get a good sense of kind of the size and scale from the video here. Uh, what I really like about the 80 millimeter airplanes is not only the fact that you can use very common 6S batteries and get good flight time and good performance, it's easy to transport. 
you can put this in your car, in most cases, fully assembled. Right. Now I take the wings off. Now the wings come off with a couple of bolts and there's just a couple of quick servo connections, it's easy to do, um, but you don't really have to take it off. The nose cone, by the way, maybe you could show them, yep. Uh, it is magnetic, which is nice because that keeps uh, the airplane a little shorter and makes it a little easier to uh, move it, maneuver it without banging the nose into things or yep. poking the nose into things. Yeah, uh, so that is kind of a nice edge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you if you taxi off, right. off the runway and you bounce into a fence or something like that, it'll knock the nose swap off. You just it pop it back on or swap yeah. it out. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of good practical features of this airplane, practical size, and I think again, really good performance for uh, the type of batteries you use. Good flight time, a little better than average and a good performance, better than average. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jason, I'm not seeing very many, any other comments on here. Guys, if you have any other questions, feel free just to let us know. We're gonna be monitoring this after the live. Uh, yes. We'd be happy to answer them to the best of our ability. Yes, yeah. thank you guys. Yeah.